in the Soviet Union, one of the most subversive, one of the most politically challenging things one can do was tell jokes. These jokes or anecdotes circulated in hushed voices. A lot of them deal with the current leader and their foibles. A common target of these anecdotes was the general secretary who was in power from the 60s to the early 80s, Leonid Brezhnev. Joke. Brezhnev received from his secretary the text of the greeting he had to read at the airport when Indira Gandhi arrived in Moscow. When Mrs. Gandhi descended from the plane, Brezhnev started his speech. <clears throat> Dear Mrs. Thatcher, his aide whispered, Comrade Brezhnev, this is Indira Gandhi, not Thatcher. Brezhnev frowned and said again, Dear Mrs. Thatcher. Leonid Illich, this is Indira Gandhi. Shut up, Brezhnev said. I know this is Indira Gandhi. But what's written here? Thatcher. Reality. Brezhnev's health was rapidly deteriorating by the mid-70s. He had suffered a series of mild strokes, a heart attack, and other physical and mental ailments. He begged to be allowed to retire from his role as general secretary. The party refused. He was still useful, so they kept him propped up. He was completely dependent on prompts, rigid protocols, and scripted behavior. And so did the policies of the country. Joke. Stalin, Khrushchev, and Brezhnev are on a train. Suddenly, it stops. Stalin says, let's shoot the conductor and three railway attendants at random to get them moving. Khrushchev says, let's tell them that true communism is just beyond the tunnel and encourage them to work towards the bright future. Brezhnev then says, comrades, comrades, let's draw the curtains turn on the gramophone, and pretend the train is moving. Reality. After Stalin's death, Khrushchev took power and denounced his predecessor. Although he did much to talk about the dangers of the cult of personality and walked back a lot of Stalin's excesses, the party never really reconciled with their Stalinist past. They decided it was better to sweep the memory of Stalin under the rug rather than address his crimes directly. Praise of Stalin wasn't allowed, but neither was direct criticism. Brezhnev eventually took control and his policy was stability at all costs. There was no need for so many drastic reforms. In the mid-70s, he stopped talking about any bright future and declared that socialism had been achieved. The discovery of massive oil reserves meant that the Soviet economy managed to chug along decently for a while. When the oil prices went down in the 80s, it was a devastating blow. Joke. Brezhnev has a meeting with Sofia Loren. He says to her, I'm willing to grant you any wish. Please, allow anyone who wishes to, to leave the Soviet Union. Sophia, you sly little minx. You just want to be alone with me. Reality. In the relative stability of the era, cracks started showing. First is the issue of consumer goods. Stores would receive products and sell them to consumers. Simple enough. But then what happened was that when those goods got scarce, shopkeepers started hoarding them. They would lose items and give them to their friends and family. Shop attendants started making deals with each other. You got meat, I got shoes, let's trade. Everything depended on who you knew. The network got more and more complex to the point that knowing the right person could mean the difference between getting your bread for the day or not. The stocks of products in stores dwindled. People waited in lines for hours to get, well, anything. It didn't matter. You're walking around the city when you see a line. You ask the woman closest to you, what are you waiting for? She doesn't know either. But you stand behind her and decide to wait in line too. Why? Well, who knows what is available? It might be something useful, something you've wanted, and something you might not be able to get anytime soon. And so you wait in line, get into the store, and find that the item is of no use to you. Maybe a woman's coat three sizes too small. No problem. You buy it and sell it to a, let's say, less than legal manner. This became the unofficial black markets. The authorities knew of their existence, but turned a blind eye to them. And sure, they might have been harmless enough on a small scale. But let's say you have your hand in a couple of networks. Maybe you're able to scale up. Maybe you have connections overseas who can bring in some illegal products. And maybe, just maybe, you can keep everyone in line by using a trick or two you've learned while serving time in Stalin's gulags. And now you've got the Russian Mafia. The stability came at military costs as well. 
The so-called Brezhnev Doctrine gave the USSR the unilateral right to suppress any dissents in the Eastern Bloc. They'd already done so in 1968 against protests in Czechoslovakia. And now in the late 70s, Poland looked like it was going to head towards a similar fate. Add this to the fact that in 1979, the USSR invades Afghanistan. It was a deeply unpopular war. Hundreds and thousands of young soldiers came back in coffins, and nobody knew why they were even there. Later critics called Brezhnev's rule the stagnation era. Whether fully deserved or not, the cracks of the systems were getting harder and harder to ignore. Joke. What has four legs and 40 teeth? An alligator. And what has 40 legs and four teeth? Brezhnev's Politburo. Reality. Brezhnev died in 1982. He was 75 years old. He was succeeded by former head of the KGB, Yuri Andropov. Andropov died in 1984, less than two years in power. He was succeeded by Konstantin Chernenko. He died in 1985. The average age of the party leadership was 70. They were dropping by the day. Don't get individual tickets to state funerals, one joke went. Buy a season pass. Things needed to change. Something drastic was required. A restructuring, if you will. And in 1985, a bombshell dropped. One that would shake things up. An explosive force so shocking and disruptive that it would flash for a few short years before crumbling the whole edifice. But before we get to 1985, let's take a look at the road so far in Soviet cinema. To recap the first three episodes, when the Bolsheviks, the ruling party, took control in 1917, cinema was an important tool in their arsenal. They used it to spread education, news, and propaganda around the vast lands. But cinema wasn't just functional. The world's first film school opened in 1919, and Lev Kuleshov's workshop created and refined techniques we still use. Visionaries like Eisenstein and others created experimental avant-garde films in the 1920s. Then Stalin consolidated his power, and in the 1930s, all the arts had to adhere to what was called socialist realism. Socialist realism was a series of rules and principles meant to make art both ideologically correct and accessible to the masses. Stalin's repressive measures and the Second World War massively damaged the film industry. The industry recovered under Khrushchev, Stalin's successor. Socialist realism was still the official art form everyone had to adhere to, but the definition of socialist realism loosened up a bit, and more experimental movies were allowed. So how did the film industry work from the 60s onwards? At the head was Goskino, the official state apparatus that decided where funding went, what projects were needed, how to distribute those movies, and which movies were to be censored. These plans went to the film studios. The biggest of these studios was Mosfilm, located in the capital, but studios existed all over the USSR. In the 1950s, a filmmaker's union was established. The point of the union was to give the creative team some bargaining power against both the ideological interests of Goskino and the profit-driven incentives of the studios and theaters. Conflicts between Goskino, the studios, and the union were frequent, but since the head of the union was always somebody the party personally selected, Goskino tended to have the upper hand most of the time. They controlled the purse strings, after all. While well, filmmakers... They tended to be a rebellious and critical lot, even during the more repressive of times. Part of this was the education they received at the film school, the VGIK. More specifically, one of the people in charge of the VGIK, Mikhail Rom. A director himself, as an educator, he tended to favor the rebellious, the free spirits, the creatives. He's the one who let someone like Tarkovsky attend the school, despite the committee's protests because he liked Tarkovsky's defiant attitude. Although Rom passed away in 1975, his influence is written all over this episode and the one before it. Practically everyone we'll be talking about here today had their creative and critical education under Mikhail Rom. In 1984, a couple of fuses ensured that the explosion of 85 would ignite the cinema world as well. Here are a few of them. 
First, a special class was introduced to help the Kazakh regions of the USSR. The teacher, Sergei Solovyov, brought a select group of cinema makers under his apprenticeship. Second, Andrei Tarkovsky defects from the USSR. In a television press conference, he brought up the fact that Goskino and the censors made working conditions practically impossible for him. He wasn't having a very good time. Our third fuse was definitely not having a good time. In fact, it was a downright miserable time for Elam Klimov. The movie he was working on, the one he had poured his heart and soul into, was stalled for years. Though it had met enthusiastic approval from some top party officials, censors slowed down the whole process every step they could. You see, Klimov was what they called a difficult director for his previous biting satires of Soviet society, including his first film Welcome or No Trespassing that uses a summer camp as a microcosm for everything wrong with the country. And in 1979, tragedy struck. The love of his life and fellow film director Larisa Shepitka died in a car crash while working on her own movie. This devastated Klimov. In fact, some say that till the end of his life, he never recovered. After making a short documentary film in honor of his wife, he took the director's seat and finished the film she was working on, a tragic tale of an island village that is about to sink into the waters because of a dam construction project rerouting the lakes. The film was appropriately titled The Farewell. But now in 1984, the film he'd been working on for eight years was finally given the green light. A year later, in 1985, Ellen Klimov released Come and See. Come and See takes place during the Nazi occupation of Belarus during the Second World War. It follows a young recruit into the partisan army, Floria, as he witnesses the brutal and horrific crimes committed in the villages. Horrific is a key word here. Klimov used techniques of horror and thriller, genres not common in the Soviet Union, to create the atmosphere of the film. The movie is called a realistic war film, and it seems ironic that a film with surreal and horror elements would get that label. Maybe it's telling that the only way to portray war realistically is through surrealism. If you look at any must-see war films, you'll find Come and See somewhere near the top. It's considered one of the best films about war ever made. Mark Cousins, in his documentary series, The Story of Film, quite simply calls it the greatest war film ever made. Klimov recounted how people fainted or had to leave the theater during the first screenings. He also talked about the one time where an elderly German man stood up after the film and said, quote, I was a soldier of the Wehrmacht, moreover an officer of the Wehrmacht. I traveled through all of Poland and Belarus, finally reaching Ukraine. I will testify. Everything that is told in this film is the truth. And the most frightening and shameful thing for me is that this film will be seen by my children and grandchildren. End quote. Ellen Klimov never made a film after Come and See. Years later, he'd say that he lost interest in filmmaking and that, quote, Everything that was possible, I felt I had already done. But that's not the end of Klimov's career. He'll be playing a very pivotal part of the story in a different role. We'll come back to that soon. For the fourth fuse, we'll have to travel to another area, to the Republic of Georgia. In the 80s, a trend emerged from that region, one that perplexed and annoyed the film authorities. A series of films with anti-Stalin themes came out. Remember, while Khrushchev removed any praise of Stalin, explicit criticism of Stalin still sat uncomfortably with the authorities. It made the party look culpable. One of these films was The Swimmer. The Swimmer is a multi-generational drama about the trials and tribulation of a Georgian family. There was one scene in particular the authorities took issue with. In that one scene, the kids are playing and throw a bust of Stalin into the aquarium. The next day, their parents are arrested and taken away. Scenes like that were cut from the original release, but the director wasn't discouraged. He boasted that, quote, I kept the uncut copy in my refrigerator, 
and I took my copy around and showed it at various cinema clubs. But this brought me a lot of trouble. I was called before the authorities and was told to desist, that I was breaking the law. But for me, it was a matter of honor to show my film exactly as I had made it. End quote. But the biggest scandal was reserved for one film that, on the surface level, had nothing to do with Stalin. This is a film about cake making, a fictional Georgian town, and a corpse that refuses to stay buried. Tenga Zabaladze's film Repentance starts with a woman making cake decorations when she hears that the former mayor of the town, Varlam, has died. The next day, Varlam's family are shocked to find the corpse of their deceased relative out in their mansion. They bury the corpse. It appears the next day. They bury it again. It appears again. They wake up to find the corpse sitting on a porch, on a table, just hanging out by the benches. Finally, they catch the person responsible, a woman named Keravan. She is taken to court where she refuses the verdict of guilty. Not that she denies digging up the corpse, but she refuses to consider that a confession of guilt. What she did wasn't a crime, so there is no guilt. She goes on to describe Varlam's reign of terror and its effects on her family. Varlam is a composite character, an amalgamation of all the worst people of the 20th century. He has a Hitler mustache, dresses like Mussolini, and looks like Beria, Stalin's right-hand man and responsible for many of the regime's crimes. Varlam's acts, the terror campaigns, the capricious arrests, the paranoia, for every three people there are four enemies, he declares, are pure Stalin. Kerevan refuses to let Varlam and his crimes stay buried. She wants the corpse out for everyone to see, for everyone to remember. Abuladze was already an accomplished director before making Repentance. Known for his poetic style, he was sitting on this idea for a while, until a near-death experience convinced him that life was too short and that he had to film his idea. The film was off to a rocky start, and not just for the subject matter. One of the actors was part of a group of seven that hijacked a plane in an attempt to flee the USSR and was then arrested and executed. Oops. But the head of the Georgian Communist Party, Shevardnadze, backed the film enthusiastically. He offered a slot on Georgian television where the film could presumably be shown uncensored. But the censors would have none of it. Even the backing of the head of the Georgian Communist Party wasn't good enough. That was 1984. Slowly, the sparks are lit. All the little fires come together. The fuses approach the dynamite, 1985. And Mikhail Gorbachev becomes General Secretary of the USSR. Boom. Gorbachev was a quintessential Soviet subject. In fact, the only ruler of the Soviet Union to actually be born in the Soviet Union. All the other leaders were born during the empire days. From a peasant family affected by the Stalinist terror, Gorbachev went to study in Moscow during the beginning of the optimistic thought period and rose the ranks in the 60s and 70s. Gorbachev was mentored by Yuri Andropov, who emphasized the need for reform. We cannot go on living like this was the mantra when Gorbachev took the role of general secretary. Gorbachev was a Soviet leader unlike any the country had seen before. At 54, he was considered young and energetic compared to the rest of the geriatric members of the party. He would go around the country and talk to ordinary people on the street. He might have been a bit imperious, prone to giving lectures and looking down on people who disagreed with him, but stern paternalistic lectures were surely an upgrade when compared to the previous punishments for contradicting the head of the party. A devoted follower of Lenin at the time, Gorbachev saw that major restructures were needed to fix the system that had strayed from what he believed was the original intention. The Russian word for restructuring, perestroika, was in everyone's lips. Gorbachev wanted to accelerate production, get rid of the old systems of control, and finally catch up with the rest of the world that had seemingly left the USSR behind. To have proper perestroika, Gorbachev had to open up floodgates like never before. His main tool? Glasnost. 
Glasnost was a policy of openness, transparency, sometimes referred to as free speech. For a true restructuring to happen, the people had to be able to speak openly about the problems of society. They had to be able to criticize those in charge and bring to light all the hidden problems and inefficiencies plaguing the system. Once that happened, there could be no turning back. That was Glasnost. And the film industry was ready. In 1986, the filmmakers' union were set to elect their new head. Previously, like most other unions, the party chose the candidate. But something unprecedented happened. Something that would have been unthinkable just a few years before. The union rejected the candidate nominated by the party. Okay, fine. Another candidate was brought forward. He was also rejected. Another one was rejected too. And another one. The Filmmakers Union, a group of people so used to being beaten down by censorship, understood that this glasnost, this openness that Gorbachev was espousing, needed someone else. Someone very familiar with the problems of censorship. Someone who had been the victim of bureaucratic and ideological suppression, and one who nevertheless persisted in his films. One of those so-called difficult directors. The Filmmakers Union elected Elam Klimov as their new president. Some argue that this process was staged, a bit of theater to usher in Glasnost. Others are not so sure. A biography on Gorbachev by William Taubman describes the scene this way. Quote, Asked later whether this upheaval wasn't stage managed from above by liberals around Gorbachev, film and theater critic Maya Turovskaya said the rebels were flabbergasted as the former leaders themselves. We hadn't agreed in advance on what to do. We hadn't prepared. It happened quietly, spontaneously, and drastically. Decades of discontent by filmmakers whose films had been cut or shelved exploded at the Union Congress between May 13th and 15th. Critical speech after critical speech, very sincere, very harsh, very strident, recalled film director Elam Klimov, who was elected the union's leader after the official approved candidate was voted down and 12 others were rejected for the union board. End quote. Klimov had a vision. A few days after Klimov's election, Goskino's head was replaced with someone more friendly towards the Glasnost policy. Klimov then started the Conflicts Commission, a group dedicated to removing impediments on filmmakers from the state. And its first mission was to release all the previously banned films. With the approval of Goskino, the Conflicts Commission raided the archives and released dozens, hundreds of films that had been suppressed. Old films were re-released, edited films were shown uncut, including the films of Klimov himself and his dearly departed wife, Larissa Shapitka. One film in particular was given attention. Repentance. Georgian head of the party, Edvard Chevanadze, had previously lobbied for the film to no avail. Now he had become one of Gorbachev's right-hand men, and seeing the events of the filmmakers' union brought up the question of repentance again. Everyone hesitated. The policy of Glasnost had just started. People were just beginning to be comfortable breaching difficult subjects. But even in this atmosphere, was repentance going too far? Not only for the USSR, but it clearly signaled to all the other bloc countries that things were drastically changing. The party decided on another unprecedented move. Let the filmmakers' union decide. They did. The film was released in 1986, first in Georgia, then in Moscow. It was exactly the sensation they had expected. It had, quote, become a social event and not just a film. Over 30 million Soviet people lined up eagerly for tickets and debated the film hotly for months afterward, end quote. People recounted that after its premiere in Moscow, quote, the film ended and there was a pause for about three minutes. I'm not exaggerating. Then people began crying out loud because there were those who experienced all that themselves, who had passed through 
All that, and who despaired thinking that no one would ever learn the truth about that terrible era. And when Tengiz went downstairs, he had to be protected because people fell at his feet, kissed his hands. I had never seen anything like it in my life. End quote. The conflict's commission moved on. Kira Muratova, for one, was overjoyed with what was going on. Muratova graduated from the VGIK in the 60s and moved to Odessa Studios in Ukraine. Her style was highly poetic in an era that had very limited appreciation for the less than easily digestible. Her film's brief encounter and the long farewell, while not overtly political, drew the ire of censors and Goskino for being not sufficiently socialist realist. She had found that her 1983 film was so butchered by the censors that she took her name off the credits before it was released. Then, quote, In the fall of 1986, during an emotional evening dedicated to Muratova's works at the House of Cinema, the director received a standing ovation from the representatives of the film world. I had always known, Muratova told the audience, that my films will come out someday. Only I did not believe that I myself would live to see that day. End quote. One person who did not live to see that day was Andrei Tarkovsky. Tarkovsky, having defected in 1984, died in 1986. He died in exile, away from the celebrations that were happening in the home country that he longed for. Tarkovsky became a sort of martyr for the filmmaker's cause. A retrospective was held in his honor, and a Tarkovsky Award celebrated new artistic achievements. People were clamoring to find an heir to their lost filmmaker. Let's look at two such potential heirs. Konstantin Lopashansky started his artistic career in a different medium. He graduated as a violinist from the Kazan Conservatory, but decided film was more his thing. One of his first projects was assisting Tarkovsky in directing the film Stalker. For more on Tarkovsky's life and the film Stalker, check out episode 3 if you haven't already. In 1986, Lopushansky released the film Letters from a Dead Man. The movie opens on a brutal, post-apocalyptic wasteland after a nuclear war. The people live in underground bunkers, and they roam the surfaces looking for survivors. Slowly, the old world is being forgotten and people cling to memories of their past and philosophize about their bleak, subterranean future. You can see Lopushansky's training in Stalker throughout the film. So in Stalker, you have The Zone, this haunting, abandoned area where everything feels a bit off, everything's a bit uncanny. The slow and panoramic shooting style of Tarkovsky gives The Zone this haunting, unsettling quality. Using the same poetic skills, Lepushansky presents us with a world of pure, unending horror. Letters from a Dead Man is brutal but poetic, philosophical, going into the minds of the survivors in a series of letters, the letters from a dead man. What makes it even more horrific, I believe, is exactly how the world ended. It wasn't a war that ended the world. It was an error. A false read on the radar made it seem like a nuclear war was imminent, so retaliatory strikes attacked what wasn't there. This initial mistake caused an escalation. It wasn't the mad ambitions of leaders that brought the end of the world, but a computer error. And to add to that horror, this incident almost happened. In 1983, an early warning radar reported that the U.S. had launched intercontinental ballistic missiles at the Soviet Union. The end of the world was only stopped thanks to cooler heads prevailing, where in a heroic test of iron will, the officer of the Soviet Air Defense Forces on duty, Stanislav Petrov, decided to defy protocol and wait things out. Letters from a Dead Man, then, is almost an alternate reality. A reality where cooler heads did not prevail and nuclear disaster escalated, showing us how easily things could have gone wrong. Oh no, wait, I'm sorry. I need to add to the horror again. This movie came out in 1986, right? You know what else happened in 1986? In April 1986, the Chernobyl nuclear reactor malfunctions during a safety check and causes one of the biggest nuclear disasters in history. Gorbachev was furious 
emphasizing the need for the transparency of Glasnost to make sure things like this won't happen again. Of course, he also made sure news doesn't spread too much about the situation. Old habits die hard. In an interview while living in Europe, Tarkovsky was asked about the current state of cinema in the Soviet Union. He singled out one person in particular. You see, he said, in Leningrad, there is a director, a cinematic genius. His name is Alexander Sakurov. Like Lopushensky, Sakurov did not start off as a director. He had studied history before entering film school in the 70s. His graduation project, A Man's Lonely Voice, was banned upon release. But working on film, he met and befriended Tarkovsky. Seeing the difficult path that lay ahead for Sakurov, Tarkovsky helped him find a job in Leningrad. As part of the celebration of Tarkovsky's life, Sakurov produced a documentary in honor of his friend's life. But old habits truly die hard, as Moscow Elegy was heavily criticized when it first came out. People were somehow surprised that a creative and idiosyncratic director celebrating his creative and idiosyncratic friend made a tribute that was too idiosyncratic. Sakurov recounts it this way, quote, This situation is nothing new. I was notified that the Commission for the Legacy of Tarkovsky actively objected to the film. The nature of the objection is not clear to me, even more so because I am supposed to be a member of the Commission myself. I'll tell you bluntly, Tarkovsky has become an object. Reminiscences of him, opinions about him must be cleared with some group or another. I disturbed the status quo, allowing myself to approach the material from an individual point of view. I was told that I do not have the right to such a point of view, to such an intonation. Unfortunately, I had to grab the film and run away from Moscow. End quote. The Conflicts Commission had a goal. In 1987, the Moscow Film Festival's main theme was the release of banned movies. They wanted to show the world how different things were. All movies previously banned out and on screen. There was one filmmaker who wasn't impressed. Alexander Askoldov. He released his first and only movie in 1967, The Commissar. The censors hounded him so badly he quit the business afterwards. Now in 1987, he found his movie conspicuously absent from the list. Here's how Askoldov tells the story. Quote, I was not invited to the festival and learned about the event only in the press. When I found out that Klimov said we must not show this film at the festival, I realized I had been silent for too long, for 20 years, and decided that it was time to open my mouth. I went to the filmmakers' union, where the new leadership was having a press conference. I sat in the corner of the large room and listened as my comrades were proudly telling their accomplishments in restructuring our cinema. Unexpectedly, a journalist from Brazil asked Klimov, have all the films been taken off the shelf? At that moment, my eyes and Klimov's eyes met. Obviously, my eyes spelled trouble, and Klimov said, Well, for the most part, the job is done. Everything is all right. We have already excellent relations with Hollywood, and generally speaking, we have accomplished a lot. But, to be frank, there is a problem with one picture. Personally, I think it is lacking in artistic quality. This happens, you know. It happens that a film may not be so good, and in addition, it may have some problems. Here, something uncanny happened. As if someone poked me in the back, I walked across the room, stopped before Klimov, and told him that I wanted to address the audience directly. Even Klimov was taken aback. I was handed the microphone and delivered a very short speech. End quote. As Koldov's film The Commissar was shown the next day. Well, so much for controversial movies of the past. But already we can see that things weren't as smooth as they had hoped. There were issues, old habits, entrenched mentalities, and other factors that weren't being addressed. How did the present directors tackle the new issues of the perestroika era? I want to start by drawing attention to two directors who had already been known for their criticism, if a bit more subtly before that. Comedy had always been a means of expressing dissatisfaction with the status quo. A genre of tragic comedies or sad comedies expressed this. The genre is described as laughter through tears. Gorgi Danelia was one who excelled in the genre. His 1980 film Autumn Marathon is a sad comedy par excellence 
and is considered one of the best representations of the late Brezhnev era. In 1986, under Glasnost, he went in a quite unexpected direction with his film Kinjaja. Kinjaja is a sci-fi dystopian story about two men who end up stranded on a planet in a faraway galaxy. The dystopian planet is a world where the logic of the black markets prevailed. The Soviet black markets, with their hoarding, their obsession with finding things to sell, and where the value of things is based on price, have won on this planet. It's a hyper-capitalist wasteland of class ratification, and where people have to buy oxygen to repopulate their dead and barren home planet. If the movie sounds grim, it really is not. The film is described as Mad Max meets Monty Python, and that's a perfect description. The societies of the Kinzadza planets revel in absurdities. When it's revealed to them that the planet is divided between two classes, the Chatlanians and the Patsaks, one of the protagonists takes an interest in the system. How does one determine who is a Chatlanian and who is a Patsak, he asks. They take out a small device and put it at one person. The light turns orange. They point it to another person, and the light turns green. There's a Chatlanian, there's a Patsak. Yes, but what is the basis of this difference? Is it ethnicity, class, or something else? Are you blind? The man answers back, agitated. The light is orange, this light is green. But then they reach another area. The roles are reversed, and the once dominant Chatlanian, with no rhyme or reason, suddenly shows submission. The language they speak has only two main words, ku and q. Ku is a word that refers to most things, and q is a swear word. The only objects that have their own separate words are objects sold in the markets. Kinjaja is a beloved movie. The criticism and social commentary come packaged in fun and zany adventures, with catchphrases and concepts that still form the pop culture vocabulary. On any list of recommended Soviet films, Kinjaja will likely be on there. Our second director of the sad comedy genre is somebody we'd already talked about at length last episode. Eldar Ryazanov never intended to be a comedy director. It was thrust upon him in the early days of his filmmaking career. But it's within comedy that he found his voice. In 1975, he released Irony of Fate, and it's become tradition since then to watch the film on New Year's Eve across post-Soviet countries. But more about that movie in our previous episode, episode 3. Even before the time of Perestroika and Glasnost, Ryazanov's social criticism had started becoming more biting, in 1979, he released the film Garage. The film is shot in one location, and the plot is simple. A cooperative holds a meeting to discuss an issue. The issue is this. Because of a new highway being built, some members of the cooperative will have to give up their parking spots. Nobody wants to do that, and they spend the entire movie arguing about who to expel. Once cordial members of the cooperative turn on each other, and Garage was Ryazanov's sketchbook in which he drew all kinds of figures from society, from the black market profiteer to the loafing son of a high-ranking party official, each trying to use their own privilege to screw the others over. The movie was based on a true incident that shocked and saddened Ryazanov. The scenario was similar. A meeting about lack of parking spots of the film studio employees turned nasty quickly. People Ryazanov had considered decent showed an uglier side as the battle for the parking spots raged on. He recounts that, quote, I returned home after the meeting feeling absolutely deafened. Many of my friends were among those present, people I once considered perfectly decent. At the meeting, though, they showed an entirely different side of themselves. I saw a herd of people devoid of conscience. They'd forgotten about fairness and had become both indifferent and cowardly. It was as if their masks of conscience had fallen away, revealing the ugliness and monstrosity of their faces. End quote. The person Ryazanov reproached most was himself. He felt guilty for not speaking up, for staying quiet. Garage was a way of expressing that guilt. And when Perestroika began, Ryazanov spoke up even louder. He was skeptical of the whole project. Not that he didn't agree that reforms were needed, but a more embittered Razanov felt that the whole project would be massive resistance that it might not be able to overcome. As we'll see soon, both Razanov and Danielia's concerns proved prophetic. Razanov's first film under Glasnost was Forgotten Melody for a Flute, released in 1987. 
The opening scenes show workers heading to their offices while this incredible parody song plays, a hymn of the bureaucrats. We're people of paperwork stature. We have always been and always will be in nature. We burn out when we allow, therefore we forever disallow. Nothing stronger than the red tape structure. No perestroikas can make in it any fracture. We're functionaries, soldiers, gladiators of the colossal bureaucratic apparatus. The main character, Filimonov, works in the Directoriate of Leisure Time. This is the office that approves or rejects public's performances, and the Directorate starts off the movie in deep crisis. See? It's perestroika now, and policies of glasnost means they can no longer ban performances explicitly. So the Directorate comes up with creative ways of stopping people from expressing themselves. The film is punctuated by the musical interlude of a choir, that the directorate hilariously sends to more and more remote regions. Filimonov was a flute player who abandoned his youthful dreams to marry the daughter of an important person and climb the bureaucratic ladder. Things change when he falls ill, then falls in love with the nurse that takes care of him. The structure so far is a typical Ryazanov movie, grown-ups taking stock of their lives and wanting to reclaim their lost dreams through love. But the movie is more ambiguous here. First of all, Filimonov is far from innocent. He's having an affair, cheating on his wife with a far younger woman. And the decision he makes as he gains more authority shows how easily someone can be seduced by the call of the colossal bureaucratic apparatus. Without giving away too much, forgotten melody of a flute ends tragically. The melody remains forgotten, or at best, merely half-remembered. The constant jump into Filmanov's imagination show that the biggest regrets in life isn't what was, but the what-ifs of the present. Forgotten Melody of a Flute Player is a cruel film, Ryazanov said, but my next film will be even crueler. He wasn't kidding, because in 1988, Ryazanov released Dear Elena Sergeyevna. Dear Elena Sergeyevna. You know, I feel bad for the person who, walking down the street, saw a poster for a new Razanov movie and thought to themselves, I could watch a little comedy, only to encounter this harrowing tale of social collapse. Dear Elena Sergeyevna follows a group of teenagers who visit their school teacher to surprise her for her birthday. Their intentions become clear early on. They're trying to butter her up so that she will change their bad grades. The teacher, the titular Elena Sergeyevna, as a timid, quite naive teacher who grew up in the 60s during the time of optimism and growth. She doesn't know how to handle these bitter, cynical kids who don't respond to her increasingly rigid slogans. The movie takes place in the apartment as tensions rise between students and teacher. Dear Elena Sergeyevna was based on a play. When Ryazanov watched this play all the way back in 1982, he knew he had to make the film. He also knew it was impossible to film it in 1982, and when Perestroika started, he saw his chance. The script of the film mostly follows the play, so you got a series of dialogues that reflect generational gaps, morality, and the extremes people will go to to gain power. The directorial choices also reflect this foreboding feeling of doom and claustrophobia. I mentioned last episode how Ryazanov's comedies of the 70s sought solace in the private realm at the exclusion of the public. Characters lived within the safety of their apartments, with the outside world depicted as cold and lonely. There's no such solace left anymore. When the students enter Elena Sergeyevna's house, the camera pans to the television. The news describes a series of conflicts, catastrophes, and crimes. The disaster has already infiltrated the private realm. The catastrophe is now inside the house. The teens in Dear Elena Sergeyevna are just a few canvases in the many portraits of youth that came out during the Perestroika era. Last time the USSR saw drastic reforms, back in the late 50s and early 60s, there was also a proliferation of movies about the young. Back then, the movies used youth as a symbol of hope of the future. Not so in the 80s. The filmmakers saw the world around them and weren't so sure about things like hope and future. Promises of future prosperity seemed hollow compared to the present reality. Children born into a system that their parents don't seem to believe in anymore. 
It was a common trope of those movies to have school scenes where a student interrogates their teacher about the meaning of things, and the teacher is just unable to answer. And the disastrous Afghanistan invasion was ongoing, so after school, students had to look forward to being conscripted to war and an increasing inequality gap. A Latvian documentary in 1986 encapsulated the situation perfectly in its title, Is It Easy to Be Young? The documentary is a snapshot of life as a teenager in the late 80s, from rock concerts to juvenile delinquency to fears of conscription. A young viewer described their point of view as such, quote, Our generation grew up in an atmosphere of pompous ceremonies at the sound of pre-recorded ovations and hurrah shouts. Many of those words which we heard from childhood became a habit, lost their meaning, and their utterance became a ritual. We were obedient and observed the rituals. Did our homework without asking about its purpose, its meaning. We lost our illusions incredibly fast. And at 17 to 18 years of age, we feel completely powerless. What can we change? We cannot escape these decades. That's the way they have shaped us. End quote. Now, you might be thinking of movies that angrily denounce the kids these days, moralists bemoaning the loss of values and denouncing teens who just want to party and listen to rock and roll. But the teenage films were more interested in depicting the effects the system had on the psychology of the people living in it. A lot of those films were quite sympathetic to their subject matter. And one thing I appreciate about these films is how awkward the characters are. Depicting kids and teens in movies is always difficult to portray right. You are stuck between the two extremes of a bright-eyed innocent creature of pure light or teenagers that act like miniature adults, perfect in their appearance, mannerisms, and witty comebacks. The Perestroika-era movie teens feel a lot more real in all their slickness and awkwardness. You have a wide and interesting range of characters. From the calligraphy-loving wannabe trickster figure in Shoot to the former professional gymnast struggling to live a normal life in Kukolka, the gangs that roam the streets looking for fights with metalheads and punks in My Name is Arlequino, to a 15-year-old who loves to play-act his version of Stalin's terror and Plumum or the dangerous game. The coming of age takes many forms, but never as one would expect. My personal favorite is the 1986 film directed by Karan Shachnazarov, Courier. The film follows the life of one Ivan Baryshnikov, a high school graduate who sets out to look for work. He gets a job as a delivery person, and in one of his routes he ends up in the house of a well-off professor, where he meets Katya, the professor's daughter, and the two eventually form a relationship. Ivan is dry, sardonic, disinterested in the world around him. He delivers the most ludicrous lines in the most deadpan way possible. For example, on his resume he writes the following, Quote, I was born in the province of Languedoc in 1668. The family belonged to an impoverished but noble family. My father, the Duke of de Brassac, fought in M. Laval's regiment and was wounded by a spear during the siege of Montferrat. I resided in the family castle until the age of 17 and received a good education from my mother, the Baroness of Monjou. End quote. I'm sure a lot of us dreamed of writing something like this in one of those insufferable tell-me-about-yourself job interviews. But despite all of this, Ivan is not this wisecracking badass, cooler-than-everyone teen hero. His ironic detachment has pathos to it. Throughout the film, he's taken by these impulses to engage in these jokes without himself knowing why. Both he and Katya treat their relationship as a curiosity rather than real romance. The movie, rather than condemning Ivan's pastime of breakdancing, skateboarding, and his flights of fancy, treat them as a real way where he can find a breath of fresh air from the stifling reality around him. Courier conveys a lot in the simple comedic format. Without giving away anything, the movie is able to say so much in its last two shots. The depiction of youth and society earned the movie the special prize in the Moscow International Film Festival. I consider Courier one of my favorite movies easily in my top 10, a movie I go back to a lot. But it wouldn't be fair to say that all these kids were just passive products of their time. They were also creators of their own communities. A way for young people to find one another and escape public pressure was through various countercultural movements. Officially, before 1985, the counterculture didn't exist. 
There were rock bands and experimental artists in the open, but they had to be officially registered and their work scrutinized before release. But some artists decided to go another path. Banned from performing in public, there was a whole network of unofficial publishing. Rock bands would perform in people's homes, where it was technically not illegal, and parties would take place in those apartments. These bands were very popular, especially considering that, officially, they didn't exist. One in particular, which we'll get to shortly, had a huge cult following. When Perestroika eased up the restrictions, all these bands exploded onto the mainstream. And the film that showcased the rise of this particular youth culture was Sergei Solovyov's 1988 cult classic, Asa. Not so young himself, already in his 40s, Solovyov used his directing talents and experience to introduce the world to the rock music of the underground. Solovyov was already an established director. His early encounters with mentor extraordinaire Mikhail Rom set the tone for his career as being both very talenting and also showcasing the anti-establishment playfulness he and Rom shared in common. Quote, when Sergei Solovyov applied to the school, it is said, he was accused of plagiarism. The admissions committee refused to take his oral examination. The brilliantly conceived script he wrote could not be his own, they said. Prove it, said Mikhail Rom. One examiner said the work was a Paitovsky story, another claimed it was Bunin, and yet another Prishvin. Rom sent them to the library to substantiate their claims. The case could not be proved. When Solovyov appeared before him, Rom conducted the questioning. Rom, have you read any books? Solovyov, yes. Rom, do you have any favorites? Solovyov, yes. Rom, do you want to be a film director? Solovyov, yes. Rom, see, he answered all my questions correctly. I give him full marks. End quote. So honestly, I just included this part because I love a good Mikhail Rom story. This is one of the sparks I mentioned way earlier, the major events of 1984. Solovyov taught a class to Kazakh filmmakers, contributing to the Kazakh wave of films in the late 80s. One of the students of that class was a certain Rashid Nigmanov. Nigmanov had an intense interest in the underground rock movement, and it's said that he probably introduced this world to Solovyov. The world enchanted Solovyov. His 1988 film Asa, then, was a celebration of the movement. Solovyov saw this avant-garde cultural movement as something significant. Quote, these are not destroyers, hooligans, rather, they are the guardians of art. In difficult times, when there is much cynicism, they preserve the cultural values of the past. End quote. Asa is a complex, multifaceted film with many plot threads. The main story takes place in a resort in Yalta, 1980. The usually sunny Yalta is suffering from a particularly cold and long winter, a not-so-subtle metaphor for the chill of the era. The film follows Bananan, a performer at the resort who is also part of the rock underground, Alika, a young nurse who is in the resort with her patient and lover Krimov, who is much older than she, and also a gangster. Bananan and Alika form a secret relationship where he introduces her to his world, a wonderland museum of wacky inventions and memorabilia. The two fall for each other, a dangerous liaison considering that Krimov is never far behind. Rather than the rough and brutish gangster, this boss is the most dangerous kind. Athletic, respectable, intelligent, and cultured. Throughout the movie, he's reading a book of a palace coup during Tsarist Russia, and the film goes back and forth between the 1980s and the 1700s. The actor who played Bananan was a popular artist of the underground, calling himself Afrika. The soundtrack of the film features rock artists from the 80s underground, and the dialogue of the film is occasionally punctuated by asterisks, with footnotes at the end of every act explaining the slang used by the characters. Most iconic is the ending of the film. The epilogue is a short movie in itself, separate from the rest of the plot, so it wouldn't be too much of a spoiler to describe it. A young rocker applies to the resort for a job as a musician. The director asks for his credentials. He has none. What is his address? He is a musician. He lives everywhere. She says under ordinary circumstances, she'd reject his application, but they need somebody fast. She starts off rattling a series of rules, regulation, and committee meetings he has to attend, but the rocker leaves the office, grabs a mic, and the scene shifts to a concert. The rocker is one Victor Tsui, 
and the song he sings during the end credits is We Demand Change. So every rock movement has a rock god, and for the USSR, that was Victor Tsui. From a Leningrad working class family of Korean descent, Tsui's unique vocals, nonchalant cool, and musical skills shot him up to legend status. His band Kino was one of the most influential rock groups of the USSR. Their popularity persists. We Demand Change is THE protest song, fiercely denouncing the state of things and refusing to back down until demands are met. To this day, the song is played in protests throughout the former Eastern Bloc. Victor Tsui also appeared in Rashid Nigmanov's film, The Needle. The Needle is one of the first films to openly talk about the problems with drug abuse. Tsui stars as an enigmatic drifter who gets entangled in the drama of drug trafficking and the black market gangs that run it. With The Needle, Nigmanov inaugurated the Kazakh Wave, a movement of independent-minded filmmakers working in the Kazakh regions. His motto, We demand no unified philosophy nor uniform artistic views on art. We are unified instead in our freedom and love of art. Now is as good time as any to take the story to the western regions of Russia, a part of Russia that played a significant part in history but has been neglected in our episodes, the former capital of Leningrad. The city itself went through many name changes, St. Petersburg, Petrograd, Leningrad, and these days back to St. Petersburg. It was the capital of the Russian Empire from the 18th century until the establishment of the USSR. The capital was moved back to Moscow as a way of curtailing the influence of the old aristocracy. It was more or less left behind in the politics of day-to-day -day life. But as a former capital, a place that was vibrant with culture and art, and now a place that was relatively left to its own devices, Leningrad became the perfect site for the underground movement to thrive. Leningrad became a place for underground publication, music, and performing arts. When Perestroika relaxed restrictions on their movement, the rock scene was an important part of the youth culture. Large-scale concerts and many new fashion styles emerged from Leningrad that all over the Union people were now following. The rock of Leningrad had a socially conscious and artistic driving force. In the movie The Burglar, for example, there are large portions of the movie devoted to the protagonist's older brother, a rock star, and his concerts. These concerts are a mix of rock, performance art, free jazz, open poetry, in other words, all the underground put together. Leningrad also experimented with interesting, new, even outlandish forms of cinema. You got short films like Tractor, which starts off as a normal documentary about the wonders of a tractor, something you probably would have seen in the Stalin era. A voice narrates dryly the advantages of using a tractor, and as the film goes on, the narrator gets more frantic and the praise of the tractor as a miracle for the worker turns into an existential meditation on the meaning of it all. Another film showed footage of a parade in the Brezhnev era, and that's it. There's nothing added, nothing edited, nothing changed. The footage itself, with its effusive praise of the comrades so devoted to the cause that they stood out happily in the rain for hours to show their love for the party, was absurd enough on its own that no further commentary was necessary. Perhaps the most bizarre of the trends in Leningrad was a style known as necro-realism. The necro, the word for dead or corpses, became a fascination for those Leningrad avant-garde filmmakers. Their movies focused on death, decay, but also they had their actors assume bizarre, unnatural poses, like a corpse being pulled by a marionette. They filmed their movies in black and white with a style very similar to the 1920s, which was the last time the avant-garde and experimental cinema played a big role. A lot of them had elements of horror, such as It or Mr. Designer. These movies were an allusion to the times where these young filmmakers grew up in, in Brezhnev's 70s, where, quote, the empty words pronounced by zombies on towering podiums. This cinema, known as parallel cinema, was something new and extraordinary. In a place where every film needed approval from the state through Goskino, the fact that independent artists were emerging signaled that a complete transformation had indeed occurred. And just in time too, because in 1987, another bombshell. The Directive of Self-Sustainability. Okay, I'm not sure how much you're all interested in hearing about the economics of the film industry, but indulge me a bit here. As I mentioned earlier, Goskino was the branch of the state that oversaw movie productions. The two major mechanisms of control Goskino had was budgeting and distribution. 
I've talked a lot about this or that movie getting censored or cancelled, but what does that mean exactly in this context? What is censorship? Well, if Goskino weren't too keen on a project, they'd be able to withdraw financial support for it, making it difficult for the director to find the proper equipment necessary to make the film. And even if the film did get made, they could just refuse to let the movie be shown anywhere. They controlled budgeting and distribution. Goskino subsidized the movie industry. They took care of the business side of things, so to speak. That's where they got all their power from. So, 1987. Gorbachev moves forward with more sweeping reforms. We got Glasnost, freedom of expression, we got perestroika, restructuring, and now we got a new keyword, Chosrashiot. Okay, that's a bit of a mouthful. But that translates to something like self-management or economic planning. The industry, all industries, would be responsible for their own funds and their own profits. The companies get uncoupled for central planning and get to go their own way. If it sounds like capitalism, we're not there yet, but it's getting close. There was still social and economic support for the industries, especially those deemed important for the country. But now managers and workers took on more responsibility and autonomy. The plan for the movie industry was to have Goskino be something like a bank. They would give out a lump sum and a plan for the movie studios. The studios would have to pay back that sum and keep whatever leftover profits they had. Something like interest-free lending. I'll let Anna Lawton in her book Before the Fall describe the plan. Quote, The first stage towards the implementation of Khazrashiot was to change the mechanisms of allotments from the Koskino yearly budget to the film production. Starting with 1988, each creative association within the studios received a bulk sum based on a production program submitted by Goskino. The association is then responsible for producing the films of its choice and returning the original sum at the end of the first year of release. If there is profit after expenses, the association has a right to keep it and reinvest it in the production of new films. The association may also use the profits to update the studio's technological base, which in most instances was in dire need of renewal. The second stage, Khazrashat on a full basis, will begin when the association no longer needs to borrow the initial capital from the state, but will be able to plan and finance their films from profit alone. This cannot happen as a rule before three or four years from the beginning of the reform, allowing two and one half years for production time and one year for circulation. End quote. While this had no doubt advantages for producing movies, they would eventually prove disastrous for circulation, but that's for later. This plan led to an increase of independent movie studios like the Leningrad School. It also led to an interesting new debate. Having to be self-sufficient meant creating your own funds. This means having to make sure your movies are profitable. This seems intuitive, but think of it this way. The earlier Goskino model for all of its faults and repressions meant that film studios, if given the green light, were free from worries about making a profit. Of course, they wanted a film to be popular, and the success of a movie with audiences was a big factor in getting more funds from Goskino. But profitability is so much more than ticket sales. Think about all the things that go into generating maximum profits. Cutting corners on production, opting for cheaper equipment, underpaying studio staff and crew, undercutting the competition, working with cinemas to get an advantage in distribution, merchandising, and so on. Since Goskino was in control of everything, film equipment and all, studios didn't have to worry about those expenses. Salaries were set by the state and not by producers. Distribution was equally handed by Goskino and was based on the ideological suitability of the movie. And merchandising? That just didn't exist. But even the film content itself. If the film was deemed suitable, ideologically, there was a lot of freedom for directors to experiment and not worry whether their experiments have mass appeal. It isn't unusual in Hollywood for film directors to make commercially successful movies in order to raise their status and get enough funds to make their own passion projects. Something they considered more artistically important, but might not bring in the sales figures. It's odd to think about since we've taken the importance of profit for granted. But this was a different world. 
Even Andrei Tarkovsky, when moving to the West, was shocked to find himself having to worry about money, something he never had to think about before. Quote, It's difficult to work here. Everything is converted into money, and I had to make the film on very little means. For the first time, I found myself in unusual circumstances which I have been inwardly opposing. There is a system of putting pressure on the director's thoughts here. The question is always put this way. Is there money for it? It's difficult to maintain the necessary creative focus under new circumstances. Many things get in the way. End quote. Filmmakers hearing the news of self-sufficiency worried about the same thing. Just a year earlier in 1986, they were finally given the freedom to make the movies they wanted to make. Would that freedom be taken away now that profitability became an issue? Transitioning from 1986 to 1987, Klamov declared, quote, Our union began decisive activity in bringing back to health our film industry in the year of the tiger. Now we are entering the year of the rabbit. From our common everyday understanding, the rabbit is a simple-minded, timid creature. But the sages of the Eastern calendar attribute to him characteristics such as thrift, enterprise, and the ability to undertake unexpected, unpredictable, non-conformist decisions. End quote. The structural reforms were introduced. Studios were broken into smaller, decentralized units taking care of different types of movies. Directors that had proved their skills, people such as Solovyov, Shakhnazarov, and Menshov, director of the Oscar-winning film Noska Does Not Believe in Tears, oversaw these smaller production units to guide the artistic crew. The union created a fund to help crew who might find themselves unemployed in between film projects. And then the debate. What kind of films will be made now? People were worried that filmmakers would no longer be able to make artistically and socially challenging films, instead having to churn out blockbusters for a quick ruble. Could this system create another Tarkovsky? Some film critics already saw this happening. They believed that socially and artistically important films were disappearing, opting for cheap thrills instead. Others disagreed, claiming that the mass appeal movies actually had a purpose. Quote, Actually, the understanding of art and of cinema in particular among the masses is substantially different from our professional understanding. It is based on psychological mechanisms of identification, on a direct juxtaposition of art and life, especially at the emotional level. In this light, films like The Disco Dancer and Essenia are the most truthful films. They are films about me. End quote. That's one way of looking at it. Films with mass appeal aren't just cheap thrills. They're a mirror in which we see ourselves reflected, our hopes, our dreams, our vision of the world. On the other hand, do we really want to be staring at a mirror all day long? Poetic films, socially challenging films, take us out of ourselves in order to experience the world and our position in it in a new way. Which one is more valuable? Which one should be given more attention? Let's give Klimov the final word here. Quote, The problem facing our cinema today is not that vulgar films attract big audiences. The problem is the constant flow of dull films that do not attract anyone. Let the difficult films find their audience, however small, and let the good comedies attract millions. The crucial point here is to stop the flow of grayish pictures. End quote. They abandoned the gray and went pitch black. Large families cramped in decrepit apartments, normally calm people having sudden and violent outbursts, gangs of teenagers roaming the streets looking for fights, alcoholism as a means of drowning out one's sorrows, Stalin's pictures hiding in every corner, adultery, prostitution, drug usage, suicide, and murder. Welcome to the world of the Chernucha. Chernucha, a play on the Russian word for black, was originally a derogatory word to describe the stream of bleak and depressing movies that were coming out in the late 80s. They referred to films that have a pessimistic and cynical view of society. They had names such as Feast of Dogs or Assuage My Sorrows, and were characterized by the collapse of the family, the death of ideals, and a hopeless view of the future. Hysterics that came out of nowhere and died down, usually as a result of stifling communal living. In a word, you know that stereotype of depressing East European movies? That's Chernucha.
One goal of the movies was to find a middle ground between mass appeal and difficult films. They offered biting critiques of society, while also giving audiences some titillation, sex, drugs, violence, and readily identifiable characters. These films were popular. They were also praised as daring, as new. Western film critics especially rushed to gather the Chernucha films coming out of the USSR. Other critics weren't so positive about these negative films. Critic Irina Shalova saw the films as ultimately hollow. They didn't say anything truthful, they just echoed back the frustrations of the audience. Quote, In the detached accusations, in these cold condemnations, the emphatic act of repentance, in these contemporary games, there is as much truth as in the sugary fairy tales of the early 1940s, full of unrestrained optimisms. Then, the viewers expected reassurance. Now, they expect denunciation and revenge. Cinema responds to these expectations and, bluntly speaking, speculates on them. One critic was particularly scathing of the trend. He found that the Chernucha was still conformist. Quote, It is a really amazing thing, this glasnost in feature films. On the mass level, it boils down to active sexualization, partial narcotization, and formal anti-Stalinization of the screen. Pardon my difficult neologisms. My colleague Andrei Dementiev is right. As to describe contemporary Soviet cinema, he said, A naked woman sits before a portrait of Stalin and smokes marijuana. It is as if the words you may were pronounced, and the filmmakers, used to collective action, eagerly shouted, Ready! Clichés! 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 Here is Stalin. There is a naked back. Here again a needle in the vein. One critic maintains that Glasnost is being trivialized by images without substance. Because of the fear that tomorrow freedom of expression be taken away, everyone seems to rush to say his or her word. Now our critic continues, Everyone has already spoken, everything has already been said, and we are fed up. And if you do not like to be ordered, you may not. We will shout at you enough. End quote. Is there truth to these accusations? Are overly pessimistic films just as cliched and conformist as overly optimistic ones? Or is this just a case of prudish conservative outcry disturbed by the amount of sex and realism on the screen? In any case, one movie that won both critical and commercial acclaim in this genre was the 1988 film Little Vera. Little Vera was the project of a young husband and wife duo, with husband Vasily Pichul as director and wife Maria Chemlik as screenwriter. Chemlik had the idea for Little Vera back in the early 80s but could only realize it under Glasnost. She saw all the movies of idealized families living in glamorized apartments in big cities and wanted to counter that with the reality of her lived experience. Little Vera starts off with a frame shot of a city it takes place in, the industrialized port town of present-day Mariupol, Ukraine. Most of these movies would start with a major shot of a big city like Moscow, showing the city bustling with life, the clear skies, the rivers, the skyscrapers. The city of Little Vera is choked with factory smoke. The stifling air paralleling the stifling family life our protagonist Vera finds herself in. Vera is a recent high school graduate who lives with her alcoholic father and a pragmatic, no-nonsense mother. Vera works hard to create the appearance of a carefree teenage life. She dresses fashionably, she goes out with her friends, she flirts with boys, she plays popular rock music while smoking out of the balcony. This image constantly rubs against the cramped, physically and psychologically, conditions of her family life. Like Courier before her, she has a dim view of the future and will use socialist cliches ironically to deflect these anxieties. Early in the movie, Vera attends an underground rock concert that is broken up by the police. There she meets a handsome and charismatic college student, Sergei. The two hook up in what is considered to be the first sex scene in Soviet cinema and fall in love. They decide to wed, but Sergei moving into the already cramped living quarters of Vera's household escalates into violence. Little Vera translates into English as Little Faith, describing the spiritual condition of its characters. But this film is not without heart. Things are bleak, they're dark, there's little faith left. But even in these dark conditions, the characters find moments of joy and companionship. Even amidst the hulking husks of decaying industrial equipment, the young characters run, laugh, and play. 
The truthful depictions of family life made little Vera a success, both critically and commercially. Vera's actress, Natalia Nagoda, won Best Actress of the Year. The movie found success abroad, winning prizes in Montreal and Venice. Like all successful movies, it attracted a lot of controversy. Some people blamed little Vera for all sorts of social ills. One person wrote to Natalia directly, saying that he hated the movie so much he watched it eight times. And social ills there were. Now in 1989, the initial enthusiasm of Perestroika hit a wall. Glasnost, newspapers, TV stations, and movies kept talking about the social ills, kept unearthing the crimes of the past, and kept denouncing political actors. Some thought it was too much. A chemistry teacher in Leningrad caused a fury of controversy when she released a letter titled I Cannot Forsake My Principles, where she denounced perestroika and defended the actions of Stalin. In 1989, a documentary titled Is Stalin With Us? interviewed people across the nation to find their opinions on the defamed dictator. Is Stalin With Us? ends with the uncomfortable answers, yes, he is. Stalin, like Varlamov in Repentance, refused to stay buried. Vasily Pichul's next film, Dark Nights in Sochi, just a year after Little Vera, already painted a much bleaker picture. Pichul defended the con man main character of the movie in very damning terms. Quote, But I don't think the character can be interpreted negatively. He is a free man who earns his living the best he can. He is guilty of nothing. It's the government that's guilty. It's the absurd way the society functions that produces this sort of behavior. You must understand that, at this moment, perestroika has nothing to do with our daily lives. End quote. Joke. A Soviet man is waiting in line to purchase vodka from a liquor store, but due to restrictions imposed by Gorbachev, the line is very long. The man loses his composure and screams, I can't take this waiting in line anymore. I hate Gorbachev. I'm going to the Kremlin right now and I am going to kill him. After 40 minutes, the man returns and elbows his way back to his place in line. The crowd begins to ask if he has succeeded in killing Gorbachev. No, I got to the Kremlin all right, but the line to kill Gorbachev was even longer than the line here. Reality. People felt that there was a lot of glasnost, but not much perestroika. Reforms did little to solve the problems of distributing goods and the hoarding by the increasingly mafiaistic black market. Shelves were still empty, quality still in decline. Stubborn bureaucrats led to inconsistent reforms. Lines for food and other necessities got longer and longer. All the problems of the old order just got exacerbated. 1989 was disastrous for the old order in the Eastern Bloc. Protests erupted all over the USSR-backed countries. While in the past this would be solved by military intervention from the party, Gorbachev refused. He urged the communist leaders of those countries to solve their problems democratically. The Soviet tank stayed firmly in place, and one by one, the communist parties all over fell. They fell in Poland, in Hungary, in Romania, and most famously, the Berlin Wall in November 1989. So socially and politically, things were a mess. The Chernucha movies grew more pessimistic, and were they ever pessimistic? One report showed that, quote, according to the data of Iskustvo Kino, in 35% of movies made in 1989 to 1990s, heroes either die, commit suicide, or degenerate completely as personalities, end quote. But something else happened. Amidst all the chaos, all the uncertainty, the world crumbling as every day new fault lines and all the rules of life seem to change before one can learn them. Movies laughed. It was a laughter in the face of absurdity. A laughter you get when the bad news just feels so unreal, so surreal, that laughter is the only reaction you can muster. A series of absurdist dark comedies came out during the end of the 80s. Karen Shachnazarov, director of the youth film Courier, released Zerograd. The movie is a Kafka novel as seen through an SNL skit. An engineer from Moscow visits the titular Zero City on a routine work trip. He soon entangles himself in a strange intrigue when he visits a restaurant, is presented with a cake shaped like his head, and then the chef kills himself after the gift is rejected. Or was he murdered? 
The whole film allegorizes the senselessness of the old system when the murder investigation leads to long-lost relatives, conspiracy involving rock and roll, and a visit to a museum of historical inaccuracies and falsehoods. At roughly the same time, another director of youth film, Sergei Solovyov, released Black Rose as an Emblem of Sorrow, Red Rose as an Emblem of Love. Solovyov made three films from 88 to 91, which he called the Perestroika Trilogy, or the Songs of the Motherland. They're a good barometer for the feelings of the era, so I'll look at all three. First, we had Asa, which reflected defiant optimism of the early era. And now barely two years later, the mood has shifted completely with this film. Black Rose is an emblem of sorrow, Red Rose is an emblem of love. Solovyov stated that the film was made in the genre of decay, but of comedic decay. The film takes place in an apartment in a street of misfits, The Ship of Fools. It's a film that's quite hard to describe, highly divisive, I might add. It's either a work of genius or utter madness. The film manages to break all the secret and hallowed symbols of the Soviet Union and just shove them in a blender till they liquefy and lose all sense. Stalin is depicted as an old man suffering from bowel issues. Industries are now neon lights disturbing the sleep of residents, and the aurora an important ship in the early revolution, appears every once in a while in weird 80s CGI with no rhyme or reason. Even filmmaking itself is thrown into the blender of irreverence. There's a sequence in the middle of the film where it just inexplicably turns into a 1920s style silent movie and it is just one of the most bizarre scenes I've ever seen on film. This is not a movie that leaves anyone indifferent. Looking at the reviews, you'll notice people going either, this is a work of genius, or what the hell did I just watch? There is no middle ground. Also in the comedic style of decay, but maybe a little more humane, is Yuri Mamin's Fountain. Mamin was a student of both masters of sad comedy, Ryazanov and Danelia, which explains his humanist touch to the genre of decay. Fountain takes place in a crumbling old apartment complex. We follow the lives of the colorful inhabitants of the grayish complex, a couple that works in the black markets, a Russian man who gets a visit from his Muslim father-in-law, a musician who draws inspiration by donning a pair of wings and gliding down from the side of the apartment, an event that all the kids in the neighborhood gather to watch. The film depicts people trying to live their best lives in these uncertain times. One of the clever visual metaphors of the film is when the roof is collapsing, they try to prop up the wooden beams with old banners of party slogans. They find the banners are too weak to prop the roof up. Ultimately, when things start to deteriorate, the community manages to find itself. To find time to celebrate and hold a festival, giving the critical lens of the movie a lighthearted feel. A film that was absurd yet anything but lighthearted was Kira Muratova's Aesthetic Syndrome. We talked earlier about Kira Muratova, the Ukrainian director whose early films were banned and who found new life in Perestroika. Now that she was making new films, she managed to push the boundaries that disturbed even the permissive Perestroika-era authorities. When they see me, they think I'm a weak little woman, Muratova once said, but then they find out I'm a monster. Aesthetic Syndrome was banned initially, one of the few films that got banned by Goskino this late in the game. The Conflicts Commission had to lobby hard to finally get the film released unchanged. The film's title, Aesthetic Syndrome, describes a medical condition where one experiences constant fatigue, apathy, and nervousness. Burnout in today's language. We first see our apparent protagonist, Natasha, who after the death of her husband, suffers a nervous breakdown. She gets into fights and yells at people in the street. She picks up strangers to sleep with and kicks them out. She tries to resign from her work as doctor, yet no one takes her seriously, so she attempts to sabotage her career and her social reputation. I won't give any spoilers, but something happens in the middle of the film that completely reframes the story. We then get another perspective that shows an entire society suffering from the aesthetic syndrome, a society of burnouts and nervous breakdowns. Aesthetic syndrome was a critical darling. It's considered an avant-garde masterpiece. Some critics go as far as to say it's the only masterpiece of this era. A harsh condemnation of other movies, no doubt, but it goes to show the important place aesthetic syndrome holds in Soviet filmography. Things were unraveling. 
and the USSR ethnic conflicts erupted in Georgia, Azerbaijan, Armenia, and other places, Latvia, Estonia, and Lithuania declared their intentions to secede. The old order by 1990 was obsolete. Gorbachev, either through sheer optimism or desperation, saw a new vision for Soviet society. With the older authoritarian regimes collapsed, Gorbachev imagined the end result of perestroika with the Soviet Union shining forth from the ashes as a beacon of positive influence for all of Europe. Others were not so optimistic. As we've seen with the films The Chernucha and the absurd films of decay, the writing was on the wall. Alexander Sokurov released a short documentary with a title that says it all. Soviet Elegy. Soviet Elegy is a funeral for the USSR. The mournful shots of a cemetery is followed by a listing and portraits of previous party members, starting all the way with Lenin. The film then follows one man's falling out with the Communist Party. A moment that would prove decisive. So anyone who knows how this story ends shouldn't be surprised when I reveal the identity of this man, because the man who is the subject of the elegy is Boris Yeltsin. Boris Yeltsin was the charismatic, boisterous, hot-headed, and hard-working member of the party, exactly someone Gorbachev wanted for his perestroika mission. Yeltsin was appointed as boss of Moscow, where he gained popularity for his dedication to cleaning the city of corruption. He believed in perestroika. He also believed Gorbachev didn't go far enough. He voiced that opinion quite forcefully in one of the party meetings of 87. This unprecedented act of insolence towards the head of the party was severely criticized, so much so that Yeltsin suffered a nervous breakdown. The enmity between Yeltsin and Gorbachev. It's almost Shakespearean. Two men, at first on the same side, become ideological and personal enemies, and their rivalry will tear the country apart. The Soviet elegy doesn't depict a triumphant Yeltsin, but one deep in despair and a long contemplation of what's to come. And that's quite prophetic. Remember the train joke I mentioned at the very beginning of the episode? The joke was expanded to include new leaders. And here's what it will sound like in the 90s. Joke. Stalin, Khrushchev, and Brezhnev are on a train. Suddenly it stops. Stalin says, let's shoot the conductor and three railway attendants at random to get them moving. Khrushchev says, Let's tell them that true communism is just beyond the tunnel and encourage them to work hard towards that bright future. Brezhnev then says, Comrades, comrades, let's draw the curtains, turn on the gramophone and pretend the train is moving. Gorbachev stands out of the train and rallies the people to reroute the tracks. Then Yeltsin takes a swig of vodka, grabs control of the train and drives it to the ground. 1990. Ethnic tensions are on the rise. The old Eastern Bloc allies are gone. The Baltic states of the Soviet Union, Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia declare their intentions to secede from the USSR. Gorbachev sees this as an opportunity to begin a new phase of perestroika, democratization. Elections throughout the different states. Much to Gorbachev's chagrin, Yeltsin was voted head of the Russian Federation of the Soviet Union. 1990, a law against censorship was passed. The filmmakers' union scrapped the requirement that directors had to create films in the socialist-realist style. Socialist realism was dead. Not that anyone had been following the rules for some time now. Independent studios pop up everywhere and Goskino faded into irrelevancy. And now it's time to go back to movie economics again. State censorship was gone and filmmakers found themselves facing a new form of censorship. Distribution was no longer in the hands of Goskino, and those in charge of distributing films had their own agenda. Solovyov's Black Rose as an Emblem of Sorrow, Red Rose as an Emblem of Love, found itself mysteriously pulled from certain movie theaters. Then they blamed the lack of profits on the movie. Yuri Mamin released a new movie, Sideburns, a scathing criticism of the rise of the new insidious form of ultra-nationalism. The book Before the Fall notes that, quote, According to Mammon, a front organization by the name of Orfe brought the film from Len Film for 2 million rubles, only to keep it in the closet. Orfe is not concerned about recouping the money, a sign, said Mammon, that they have already been paid off by some high-positioned people. End quote. People with money started calling the shots now. 
international B-movies flooded the market. It was cheaper for a lot of theaters to get schlocky, outdated movies than new Soviet films. 1990. Things did not look great for the future directors of cinema. The VGIK, once a factory that seemed to be able to churn out talent with ease, was now found woefully lacking. Quote, The evaluating commission noted that neither the rectorate or the VGIK Soviets were able to spearhead the perestroika of the institute and did not achieve any serious positive result in the educational, scholarly, and creative activity of all the departments. The commentary to this statement acknowledged that it was the first time a resolution of such severity was adopted to designate the work of the institution as unsatisfactory. End quote. 1990. Beloved cultural icon Victor Tsui died in a car accident. He was 28 years old and would from then on secure his position as an immortal. Victor Tsui's death marked the end of a generation. The end of a generation. Now's as good a time as any to bring the final film of Solovyov's Perestroika trilogy, House Under the Starry Sky. Another tone and genre shift. The film is a horror comedy in which the family of a well-off Soviet academic is terrorized by a mysterious figure who first show himself as a stage magician, but is soon revealed that his magic is supernatural. What's most revealing is the ending. When the devilish magician is about to be defeated, he chants the Socialist International, the original Soviet national anthem, in absolutely demonic howls. Then the past is exercised. The two young protagonists ride a hot air balloon into the sunrise, and Adam and Eve ready for rebirth. If only things were that easy. In 1991, Gorbachev announced the final major change to the Soviet Union. A referendum gave each state a chance to stay in part of the USSR or to secede. Most decided to stay. The Union of Soviet Socialist Republics were to be renamed the Union of Soviet Sovereign Republics. The states that remained would become independent republics under a federal structure. And this, this was a step too far. A cadre of old party members couldn't stand for it anymore. This was too much. Their entire system, their ideology, their world was disappearing in front of their eyes. And they saw it was all Gorbachev's doing with his radical reforms and concessions to the West. They had to stop this madness, this catastrophe. After all, Khrushchev was deposed for doing much less. If you're in the USSR on August of 1991, you might have gone home and switched on the TV, wanted to watch the news to see what was burning in the world. Instead of the news, you see a screening of Swan Lake on TV. Somehow, you feel something is terribly wrong. Gorbachev is on summer holiday with his family on August 19th, 1991. This is a day before the new treaty is to be signed. Members of the party walk in and tell him to stay put. Gorbachev knows that something is terribly wrong. Other members of the conspiracy take control and announce on television that Gorbachev was temporarily unavailable due to bad health. A state committee for the state of emergency take over. All communications are shut. All state media blocked. And the tanks head towards Yeltsin for his arrest. Yeltsin and his crew can see that something is terribly wrong. But while the Committee for the State of Emergency took control of state media, they forgot that the foreign press was now inside the Soviet Union. You turn on to CNN or BBC or any other foreign media, and this is what you see. Tanks surrounding the White House of Moscow, crowds rushing to the office to protect Boris Yeltsin, a sea of people against the army, and a defiant Yeltsin giving a speech on top of a tank. Pictures of Boris Yeltsin on the tank with the new Russian flag behind him skyrocketed his popularity. The coup attempt eventually failed. Gorbachev was released, but things could not return to normal. The other republics were spooked by this reminder of all-time party militancy and spoke of seceding. Yeltsin held a conference with Gorbachev next to him. He wanted the party leader right there next to him when he announced a ban on Communist Party activities in Russia. Gorbachev's protests were drowned by roaring applause. Gorbachev held on. 
He insisted this dissolution was illegal. It was all against the principles they had fought so hard for. The state he had controlled, the empire that covered a third of the entire globe, was now nothing but the four walls of his office room. On December 25th, 1991, Gorbachev appeared on TV to announce his resignation. Shortly after, on top of the Kremlin, the Soviet flag was lowered for one final time. And there you have it, folks. The post-Soviet world was, to put it mildly, a challenging time. Each country had its own way of handling the transition, but let's take a look at the movie industry in Russia to get even a faint idea of what things were like. The directors and industries were still there, and they made movies throughout the 90s, but most major industries were now privatized. The black market mobsters and old party members gutted the former institutions for profit, and the oligarchs took power. After privatization, filming equipment became prohibitively expensive. Mosfilm was reduced to renting out their lots to foreign studios wanting a Russian background for their movies. Movie theaters preferred importing cheap B-movies and semi-pornographic flicks to attract audiences. But the audience just wasn't there. Hyperinflation meant that movie tickets cost half the month's salary for the average worker. The 90s saw a reduction in film production that was rivaled only by the last year of Stalin's life, where repression and bureaucracy led to releasing nine movies a year. By the end of the decade, things started stabilizing a bit, and movie production resumed at a steadier pace in the 2000s. Alexander Sokurov's most experimental and famous movies would come out in the early 2000s. Kira Murotova released a steady output of films in her home country of Ukraine until she passed away in 2018, aged 83 years old. Karen Shachnazarov is currently head of Moss Film. But with a lot of older director now gone, most recently Sergei Solovyov in December 2021, some people believe that the industry never recovered quality-wise. But that's a topic for another day. We've come to the end of our series on Soviet cinema. I guess this is the time where I'm supposed to have some concluding thoughts, a nice summary to explain the lessons learned from the past four episodes. Well, I'm not sure if I have any conclusions. I just found the history, the movies, and the stories of these artists fascinating, and I hope that you, who joined me on this ride, found them fascinating as well. But here are a few disjointed thoughts in place of a conclusion. 1. Soviet cinema is part of world cinema. It might not be as well known as Hollywood or Bollywood, or even French New Wave, but the influence of Soviet filmmakers is felt throughout the world. There's a saying about the music group The Velvet Underground, their albums didn't sell a lot to the general public, but it inspired people to become musicians themselves, some who became even more famous. It might not be your favorite band, but it's your favorite band's favorite band. Eisenstein, Vertov, Dovzhenko, Tarkovsky, Parajanov, Klimov, Muratova. They might not be your favorite directors, but they are your favorite directors' favorite directors. The way they film, the way they thought about film, informs what we watch today. And that's nothing to say of the popular Soviet films that are still beloved by a massive chunk of the world. Second, a bit of philosophy about art and freedom. I've had a couple of discussions with different people at different times, but for the sake of simplicity, let's bring them together and join us in the living room to have this debate. Art requires freedom, one person says. An artist should be able to make what they want and no one can meddle. That sounds reasonable. An artist should be able to do what they want, to have their vision realized without interference, right? But think about it. If absolute freedom was a criteria for art, then art couldn't exist for 99% of history. Hold on, another person responds. The USSR had amazing movies, and they had censorship. Yes, exactly, an overzealous response. Artists need obstacles. That's how they can be creative. Censorship is a way to let real art flourish. But hold on. If you've listened to episodes 2 and 3, You'll remember that the worst of repression, post-war Stalinism, was the most difficult time for film, and that the early era of the 20s and the thought of the 60s was the best time for movies. 
objection. Too much repression is bad, but what about too much freedom? The hypercapitalist free market on steroids Wild West of 90s Russia saw a loss of movie output just as bad as Stalin's era. This is where I could say, too much repression is bad, too much freedom is just as bad. The best thing is somewhere in the middle. Then nod my head sagely as if I said something meaningful. But that's not very satisfying. What's the alternative? I don't know. Maybe freedom wasn't the most important factor in the pursuit of art? Maybe there's something else. This is where I'll make a third point. The importance of institutions. As I researched deeper into these filmmakers, I started to realize that the history of Soviet cinema is the history of the VGIK, the film school. This was where Kuleshov was able to work out his ideas, where Eisenstein taught others in his techniques, where Mikhail Rom inspired the rebellious streak of students. Students could discuss, debate, and inspire each other, a lot of whom would go out to use that inspiration to become famous filmmakers themselves. That's not unusual, by the way. Look at the history of art, and you'll find a similar pattern. The Renaissance, for example, where you suddenly saw an explosion of creativity in the fine arts. While these famous artists emerged from a handful of workshops, where they were mentored and have their talents recognized by equally competent artists, and the competitive nature of the city inspired each one to excel. Creativity is not solitary. Creativity grows when it can ping-pong among talented and properly educated people. Is that really the case? This is where I have to stay silent and pass discussion on to you. I've barely scratched the surface of this topic. There's a lot I could still talk about, like focusing more on non-Russian Soviet cinema, or on literature, or on famous animation studio, or post-Soviet cinema in the different countries. All topics to come back to in the future episodes. But for now, let's move on to a different time and a different place to explore more art movements and history. Thank you so much for listening, and I'll see you next episode.